Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session uh, sponsored by Hogstrite on uh, biometry and the use of the iStar. Uh, I'm Doug Hoke. I'm the moderator. And I have a fantastic panel here. Uh, to my left, Adi Abalafia from Hebrew University. And Adi has uh, created all kinds of things, including the amazing tool that's available on the ESRS website and ASCRS website for eye well uh, measuring, doing corneal stigmatism and measurements and uh, corneal surgically induced astigmatism. And I think you all know Warren Hill, who has probably helped more surgeons around the world with IOL calculations and understanding it than anybody I know. And uh, is also, of course, the author of the Hill RBF formula, which is an incredible uh, IOL calculation formula. And a, uh, a centerfold uh, Chinese warplane fighter. <laughs> he, 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 that's his hobby, so it's really quite remarkable. To Warren's left, David Goldblum from Basel, who's uh, the head of the Polis Clinicum. Uh, and David's got a wide range of interests, including severe corneal surface disease and osteodentokeratoprostheses, um, in addition to his interest in, in cataract surgery, but in, particularly in challenging cases. And finally, uh, Giacomo Savini, and Giacomo is, um, I think everybody knows Giacomo. He's, he's authored over 200 papers. He's, even though he's in private practice, he's become a full professor. He's the co-author of the HST formula and uh, has really been a huge contributor to our field. So we have a stellar faculty. Thank you all for coming, and I'll turn it over to Adi for the first talk, which is on my initial impressions using the iStar. And uh, I would like to share with you my first experience with the new iStar 900 and what I like about it. So starting with ergonomics and efficacy. So the first thing that strikes you is the quick measurement process. You get bilaterally fully automated measurements in typically just below 40 seconds, which means that more patient, uh, it will cause more patients uh, comfort and compliance, improved measurement quality, and also it will shorten the learning curve of your staff. And I have to confess that both for my staff and for myself, it was love from first sight. I love the easy access of the data. So it's not just PDFs. You can go to the raw data and uh, see everything anywhere in your clinic, even from home and also in your operating room. You know, from time to time, I have a patient that comes to me at the day of the surgery and just tell me, you know, doctor, I, I really thought about it and I don't want to see good for far. I want to read without my glasses. And then, so you don't need to get panic. You just go into the software and change the target refraction of your patient, and you get the IOL power calculation straight away with all these wonderful uh, formulas. OK, it has a small footprint. And we know the space might be an issue in some clinics. And you can see how packed my clinic is with all these measuring devices. So it's really an advantage. You also have comprehensive measurement options. So you have a well-elaborated summary screen. Now, we know that validation criteria are essential for accurate measurements. And what I like about it is that you can go and look at the raw data and actually evaluate your measurements. So you can click on any part that you want on the summary screen, and you will get details such as the A-B scan, uh, scan mode. So you can see all the peaks and see that they are in place. And you can even look at the IOL tilt. You have comprehensive corneal front and back topography and pachymetry zone-based keratometry, and even Zernike analysis with vision simulation, and you'll hear more about it by Warren Hill. And you can get even more with your device when you have the AC suite option. So you have extended topography with all kinds of features, such as difference maps and progression views, and even a corneal ectasia view, which was just released. You can also look at the OCT imaging of the anterior chamber, which is quite impressive. And of course, you have all the latest, I mean, some of the latest generation IOL power calculation tools. So you'll have the Barrett suite with, uh, it can utilize also direct measurements of the posterior cornea. You have the Hill RBF, and you can use it in a toric calculator with the Abu Lafia Coke formula. You have the Olsen formula, and you also have the one Coke axial length adjustment for uh, high myopia. So you don't need to do it uh, manually anymore and to think, when should I use it or not? It is just there, and it will kick in for you whenever you need it. Now, each of us has its own uh, strategy for uh, IOL power calculations. And I want to uh, share with you uh, how I utilize the um, iStar in my daily practice. So let's go through one case together. So the first thing that I do, I validate my measurement. I go and look at the corneal topography. 
I look at the curtometry, seeing that it's not smeared, and I look at the, all the gates, you know, in the A-B scan mode, and also at the corneal diameter. Now I get this warning that uh, this patient has high axial myopia of 28.7 millimeters, so I will take out, you know, uh, non-relevant formulas for this eye, such as the Hoffer Q. And I also like to uh, look what would be the predicted refractive astigmatism if I implant a non-toric IOL. And I can see looking at the different toric calculators that this is below my threshold. So I'm not going to implant a toric IOL for this patient. So now the next step is to look at the spherical equivalent prediction for all the formulas. So I have here the Barrett uh, with a predicted uh, posterior cornea, the Barrett with a measured posterior cornea, Hill RBF, Olsen, the Holiday with the one cock adjustments, and the Haggis. And I look what would be the predicted range for all these formulas. So I see that for a 6.5 diopter lens, the range is between minus 0.2 to plus 0.3. And since this is a myopic patient, I don't want to end up with a hyperopic surprise, so I'll pick a 7 diopter lens. As you can see, he came out very close to Plano, and he's very happy. Now, and the last thing is uh, precision of the data, which is a fundamental requirement for any biometer. So uh, we just uh, finished the study uh, looking at the agreement in biometry measurements between the I-STAR 900 and the Master 700. So we just analyzed it last week, so it's not published yet. And uh, we did it with the help of Nir Sorkin from uh, uh, Tel Aviv Medical Center. And we looked at 402 eyes of uh, 402 patients. And uh, there was a good agreement in most of the biometry parameters. But most importantly is the agreement in IOL power calculation, because this is our endpoint. And we looked at that using the Barrett Universal 2 with either the predicted or the measured posterior cornea. And as you can see, 98% of agreement was uh, within 0.5 diopters between the biometers with the predicted uh, posterior cornea and 96% with the measured posterior cornea. In another study by Neil Sorkin, which he did in his uh, institute, they, uh, and was uh, accepted for the JCRS, they looked at the I star 900 and the anterior device, and they found a good agreement between these two devices, uh, and also a good uh, agreement in the measurements and the IOL power calculations, and you are going to hear more about it from Dr. Savini. So uh, this was my first experience with the new I star 900 and uh, what I like about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adi. Um, so, Adi, you uh, mentioned that the acquisition time is very short with this. What's the sequence, or how does that work when you sit a patient down at the I-STAR? I mean, you, the patient just sits there, and it takes it automatically. So you, you actually don't need to do anything, almost. You just need to make sure that he's looking straight, and that's it. Wow. It, it moves uh, automatically from eye to from eye. From each step yeah. to each step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. And it's under a minute, right? Yeah. Yeah, so impressive. Okay, Warren's going to teach us everything we need to know about corneal topography in 14 minutes. Yeah, the, the Zernike pyramid in 14 minutes. It's <laughs> kind of like a death sentence, you know. <laughs> but uh, what I'm going to do first is give you all sort of a primer on the things that we as anterior segment surgeons do, and then I'll show how the, uh, the eye star puts it all together. And we're going to be using a 6-millimeter pupil because that's where patients complain the most. Let's go ahead and start now. Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk about corneal aberrations, and um, I don't have any financial interest in the aberrated cornea, but all right, let's move along here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to use three different aspects of the eye star to show us what the patient sees and help us to predict our IOL choices. So the first is the axial curvature map. We're all familiar with that. The next is the Zernike Pyramid, which is a little bit less familiar to a lot of people. And last, we're going to put the whole thing together with image simulation. And when I'm done here, every single person in this room will be able to look at an axial curvature map and understand what's going on. Here's a your humble axial curvature map. It's the most commonly used feature in, um, of a topographer. And we like it because it relates corneal shape to corneal power. And uh, it displays things in an average scaled value. In this case, it's a quarter diopter step. And we can use it to characterize astigmatism. Is it regular? Is it symmetrical? And also, we can use this to manually determine the steep meridian with tremendous precision. And this is 
one of my favorite uh, aspects of an axial curvature map. So very, very useful as a place to begin in understanding what our options are. Now this is the part where everybody kind of looks to see where the exit is. This is uh, the Zernike Pyramid, and we, if you think of it in terms of an axial curvature map, the different aberrations have to do with how the power is distributed across the anterior cornea. Defocus and astigmatism are second order aberrations, coma and trefoil are third, aberra third order aberrations, and the fourth order aberration we normally look at is spherical aberration. Coma is a form of irregular astigmatism, different powers on either side of the corneal vertex. Spherical aberration is an irregular distribution of spherical power, usually more or less in the center, more or less in the intermediate areas, like what we see with um, when we do when we do LASIK. Now, this is a typical aberration profile. Is all this necessary? Well, not really. Most of what we're interested in is just second and um, third and fourth order aberrations. But really, for when we look at um, this information for multifocal or EDOF lenses, we're mostly just looking at third and fourth order aberrations, trefoil, coma, and spherical aberration. And is this relevant to daily practice? Yes. This is keys to the kingdom as far as understanding what it is patients are trying to tell us. So a couple basic things about the human visual system. The human visual system is a contrast sensitivity detection system. Of course, we don't see with our eyes, we see with our brain. And the quality of any optical system has to do with its ability to transfer contrast from the object being viewed to the image being formed. This is a perfect eye. Everything looks exactly like it's in front in front of it, but if the cornea is aberrated or we have a cataract, then we get image degradation. And the type and the way the image is degraded depends on the type of aberration, and we're going to go through that in just a second. If the cornea is aberrated, even if we take out the lens, we're still going to have a degraded image. And so understanding an aberration profile helps us to understand what patients are trying to tell us, especially at larger pupil sizes and at night if people have had prior refractive surgery. A little bit more information. Increase in a specific aberration reduces contrast in a very specific way. And when you talk to your patients who've had prior LASIK and they say, well, the, I see two moons when I look up or things have a glow around them, that's what they're describing aberrations. And, re, and different aberrations are additive. One doesn't cancel out the other. The other thing to remember about aberrations is they come in groups. It's very rare to find a patient with just spherical aberration or just coma. If they've had prior, say, myopic LASIK, spherical aberration may dominate, but there's usually a collection of different aberrations. So the ones we're most interested in, again, are spherical aberration and coma. We'll start with spherical aberration because that's the most familiar to all of us, and some lenses uh, help to correct for that or at least uh, reduce it. But again, aberrations come in groups, not just individual uh, values. And now, Doug Koch and his associate, Lee Wong, have, have shown us that um, spherical aberration is, is normally distributed, and um, Wolfgang Haggis, George Bako, Jack Holliday showed us the same thing. If we flatten the center of the cornea, like we do with myopic LASIK, we increase the spherical aberration so the number becomes more positive, like we see with, with myopic LASIK. If we steepen the central cornea, the number shifts towards negative or maybe even become negative if we do a lot of correction, like maybe four diopters of hyperopic LASIK. So this is positive spherical aberration. It's flatter in the center than it is in the intermediate and marginal areas, very much like what we see with myopic LASIK or with radial keratotomy. If we steepen the central cornea, then it shifts away from that number 0 0.274 towards zero and maybe into the, uh, into the minus range. So here are two patients that have had different forms of LASIK. Myopic LASIK, it's blue in the center, flatter, spherical aberration goes up. Hyperopic LASIK, it's steeper in the center, shifts towards zero, or the number may actually shift towards in, into the negative range if we do a lot of a hyperopic treatment. So you should be able to look at an axial curvature map and know exactly that this patient has abnormal spherical aberration values. Coma, again, is a form of irregular astigmatism, more power above, less power below the corneal vertex. And the convention is that negative vertical coma just means that the more power is below the corneal vertex than above. Positive is just the opposite. These are just conventions as to how we talk about, how we talk about coma. So when a patient's unhappy with the quality of their vision, what they're telling you is that they have 
lost contrast. And there's a lot of things that we as ophthalmologists do that take away contrast. So image quality equals preserved image contrast. It's all about contrast. Now, if you're as old as I am, you may remember black and white televisions. What we had was reduced contrast or decreased image fidelity. And this isn't black and white. This is really gray and gray. So the difference between a black and white television and, say, a nice LED screen or a plasma screen TV has to do with the preservation of contrast at high spatial frequencies. Again, it's all about contrast. When you buy a very fancy camera lens or pay a lot of money for a telescope, what you're purchasing is the preservation of contrast. So this would be a 1080p digital TV screen, and you can see we have preserved contrast. So we as ophthalmologists need to be thinking in these terms when we um, operate on patients or when we offer them certain types of lens options that may actually be a problem. Now next is image simulation. This is the third part. And this is a naturally aberrated cornea, somebody who's had keratoconus, very steep below and maybe a little bit nasal. It's a form of irregular astigmatism. They have high coma. And image simulation is a wonderful tool that allows us to show patients how they're going to see. So this is a six millimeter uncorrected pupil with, I mean, uncorrected image with keratoconus. If we remove second order aberrations, it's like giving them a pair of glasses, but it still doesn't fix things. If we reduce the pupil size, because all aberrations are radius dependent, we can ameliorate the aberrations a little bit. That's how a pinhole camera works. And by removing second, third, and fourth order aberrations, we can show the patient how they're gonna see if they have an RGP contact lens or a scleral contact lens. And this is stuff we can demonstrate to the patient. And with the iStar, we can check and uncheck different aberrations to show them what their vision's gonna be like after surgery. And this is very helpful when people have had prior uh, refractive surgery. Now I'm gonna show you some examples. With modern LASIK, the image quality is much better, but the patients who are coming to cataract surgery are people that have had early generation LASIK. And so it wasn't quite as sophisticated as what we have uh, currently. So here's somebody who's had myopic LASIK, and again, all of you are becoming experts here. We flatten the central cornea, so the spherical aberration does what? Goes up, it's a positive number. This is mostly centered, so we're not gonna be inducing irregular astigmatism, and we have similar power in the intermediate marginal areas which is where we find trefoil. Here's their aberration profile. Spherical aberration is very high, 1.8 microns. Very normal coma values because um, the, the ablation is centered and in the intermediate marginal areas we have similar power, so the trefoil is normal. If we look at an image simulation for this patient at a six millimeter pupil, and again, this is where they complain the most. They say, doctor, at night I can't drive, I have trouble. This is pure spherical aberration, and what we get is a characteristic image halo and glow. They tell you, I look at the moon, I see, you know, this glow around it. Now, here's somebody who's had myopic LASIK, but now they have a decentered ablation, and because they have a decentered ablation, it's going to induce a form of irregular astigmatism. That's coma. So, just looking at this already, we can say that spherical aberration value is high, coma value is high. In the intermediate and marginal areas, we have similar power distribution. Trefoil is going to be normal. So if we look at the aberration profile for this patient, there's our high spherical aberration. Now we have high coma. This is somebody you're not going to want to put a multifocal lens in because they're very, very sensitive to all forms of astigmatism. Trefoil is normal. Trefoil is just something that can add to a decrease in image contrast. If we look at the image simulation for this patient, what we see is the characteristic halo and glow, and then we can look at coma, where we get image duplication and displacement. And all these people will say, when I look at a street light, I see two of them. When I look at the moon, I see two images. They're describing coma. So this is elevated vertical and horizontal coma. Here's somebody with hypropic LASIK. Now we've shifted the spherical aberration away from 0.274 towards a negative value, and in this case it actually is a negative value. It's slightly decentered, and so we're going to have high spherical aberration, but now it's negative, positive or negative, it's still bad. Mm -hmm. We're going to have high coma, which is going to give us image duplication and displacement, and some trefoil as well. So this person's going to have a degraded image due to these three things. And just looking at the axial curvature map, you can already predict what this is going to be. And these are people you do not put multifocal lenses in. 
Here's the image simulation. We have our image halo and glow. We have elevated horizontal and vertical coma with image displacement and duplication. So this helps us understand what patients are trying to tell us. Let's kind of bring it all together with the, with the iStar. And the iStar is the only device that has all this information in one place. So here's an example. So this is, this is the screen that I love on the iStar. We have our axial curvature map, so we can tell um, you know, how the power is distributed. We have our Zernike pyramid, our aberration profile. And here, it, for this patient, it shows they just have astigmatism, so only second order aberrations at a six millimeter pupil we have our image simulation. So we already know what patient's gonna see, just see like at a larger pupil size, just with a monofocal lens. So a toric IOL would be a very good option for this patient. A toric IOL corrects second order aberrations, nearsightedness or farsightedness, and astigmatism. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uncheck the second order aberrations, and there's the image simulation. And actually, we're going to show them what, they, what things look like during the daylight with a photopic pupil, three millimeter uh, pupil size. And you can see that the second order aberrations have been unchecked, and the image simulation book looks much better. So Mrs. Jones, if we put in a toric IOL, this is what your vision is going to be like. This is very powerful stuff, and it really helps the patient to connect with you as, in terms of forming a, a surgical plan. So. Understanding aberrations really does help, especially if you see patients that have had prior refractive surgery or you want to show patients how they're going to see with certain options. Now, one other area um, that's very helpful is if people have had prior refractive surgery, if they've had myopic LASIK, RK, or radial keratotomy, you can actually quantify the spherical aberration change and pick a, pick a lens. Now, the lens may not make things perfect because these values are often very high, but it won't make things worse. Myopic LASIK and radial keratotomy, we use an aspheric lens that adds negative spherical aberration. Hyperopic LASIK, an aspheric neutral lens, or if they have high negative values, then an older style spherical lens that adds positive spherical aberration. So the old adage, do no, first do no harm, this is what we do for these patients. So in summary, aberrations reduce image contrast each in a very specific way, like characteristic halo and glow or image duplication. We need to be mindful of what we're doing to our patients when we plan surgery. You do not put multifocal lenses in people with a very aberrated cornea. Just not a good idea. And when some of these people come to see us, that this is the first place we go as we look at their aberration profile. Visual quality and patient satisfaction are directly related to the preservation of image contrast. No ifs, ands, and buts. And using the right tools, like with the iStar 900, we can put this whole thing together and have a very good idea how the patient's going to see before we go to surgery. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. I think all of us see patients in our offices who have had surgery with various types of eye wells that are not appropriate had you really understood what was going on with the cornea. Um, one of the things that I've... <clears throat> I've heard there's, it's sort of common parlance that if your coma is over 0.3 and your total higher order aberrations of the cornea are over 0.5, you shouldn't get a, a trifocal or a multifocal IOL. And remarkably, there's no literature to support really what that threshold should be. It's just something that people talk about. I don't know if anybody has any comments or thoughts about sure. that. Sure. And you know, Doug and I see two or three of these people before lunch every single day. Um, the problem, the reason why there aren't hard and fast rules is, is because the aberration profile is a dance. Um, spherical aberration is a naturally occurring aberration, so it's reasonably well tolerated. The, um, the total corneal aberration number may be fictional because if they have maybe 0.35 or 0.4 microns of spherical aberration in a low coma value, they may do pretty well. So the total HOA may be uh, deceptive. Um, but it's about the reduction in contrast. So this is why looking at the image simulation is so helpful, because if you take a multifocal lens and put it behind a multifocal cornea, these people will hate you and they'll hate your dog. I mean, they'll, they become very unhappy. We see a number of patients who are unhappy with multifocal lenses referred by other physicians. And the very first place we go, I don't know if it's the same for you, Doug, is we look right at the aberration profile as a place to start. And that often gives us a wealth of information. Yep, very good point. 
Okay, Warren, 14 minutes, and then that was about two hours worth of information and so elegantly presented. Thank you. So Jacopo is going to talk to us about the repeatability of the iStar 900 and its comparison to other devices. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, we, uh, I'm going to present the data of a study that uh, has been recently uh, published on JCRS. So we had the opportunity to test uh, the iStar and to make a comparison to the Argos and IOL Master 700. These are my disclosures. So the purpose of this study was to assess the repeatability of the measurements provided by the, the iStar and their agreement with those provided by uh, two validated optical biometers, the Isle Master 700 and Argos. In a, a series of uh, unoperated eyes, uh, we took with the iStar three consecutive measurements, uh, and one with the Isle Master and one with the Argos. And we uh, evaluated uh, the most important uh, parameters for IOL power calculation that are axial length, keratometry, corneal astigmatism, central corneal thickness, corneal diameter, anterior chamber depth, length thickness, and lens, and lens tilting. And I remind you that uh, the iStar uh, is so far the only optical biometer providing uh, lens tilting measurements. And in order to assess the repeatability of the three measurements taken with the iStar, uh, we did the test-retest variability, uh, the coefficient of variation, the interclass correlation coefficient. These are standard test for this kind of studies, and then agreement between the, uh, each pair of biometers was based on the 95% limits of agreement uh, according to Bland and Altman. Reports the data of the results of coefficient of variation. I think this is the most important column, and you see that now excluded for a moment astigmatism. You see that all other measurements uh, have a coefficient of variation that in most cases are below 1%. So there's a variability less than 1% in these measurements. There is, of course, uh, like with any device, uh, higher variability of corneal astigmatism. But this is especially true for very low asti corneal astigmatism. If you take only cases with more than one diopter that are those really important for us because are those that uh, are likely to undergo astigmatism correction with a toric IOL, the coefficient of variation drops from 27 to just 2.6%. And this is quite obvious. If you have a, a corneal astigmatism of 0.01 diopters, it is quite obvious that you will find any axis of orientation. While if you have four diopters of corneal astigmatism, it will be always in the same direction and with the same magnitude. And there was also a very good repeatability for lens tilting, uh, just 2%. And uh, also for the grade of lens tilting, because you, the machine does not only tell you that there are five degrees of lens tilting, but it also reports uh, the orientation of this degree, of this tilting. And uh, these are the outcomes for agreement between iStar and IL Master, and between iStar and Argos. And you can see uh, agreement in this column with IL Master and agreement with Argos. And the p-value uh, is the result of the t-test uh, comparing the mean values. And you see that there are, we did not find almost any difference uh, from a statistical point of view compared to the IOL master. Agreement was quite good for most uh, parameters. And if we go to the IOL master, there were most measurements had a statistically significant difference, but this is just statistical, not clinical, because the difference were very, very small. And it's a paradox that uh, agreement was slightly better between uh, the iStar and Argos, according to the 95% limits of agreement, than between uh, Argos uh, uh, and between iStar and, and IL Master. Discussion of this paper, we also uh, looked at the uh, previous papers reporting their repeatability with other devices. 
In general, I can say that the repeatability was improved with respect to previous generation devices, including the Landstar and older uh, devices like the Ironmaster 500, while for most parameters, the repeatability is excellent and it's quite similar to the last generation optical biometers. So, uh, in conclusion, we found a high repeatability with the iStar for all measurements. Corneal astigmatism was the only exception, like in all studies of repeatability we have done with other instruments, mainly when the magnitude is low and when we don't have to implant a toric IOL. There was uh, no statistically significant difference between iStar and IOL master, an excellent agreement, so that we may consider the measurements between the two devices as, in, as inter, interchangeable. The only exception was, uh, were CCT and corneal diameter. And even if the difference with Argos was uh, statistically significant, the only clinical significant, uh, clinically significant difference was for corneal diameter that was 0.43 millimeter larger with Argos. So, we may take some attention, for example, with the ICL uh, sizing. And in any case, uh, agreement with ISTAR was good, and uh, uh, measurements, again, apart from the corner diameter, can be considered interchangeable. It had, uh, uh, the ISTAR had higher repeatability compared to Landstar for K, CCT, ACD, lens thickness, and axial length. It had a higher repeatability than the IOL Master 700 for K and CCT, higher repeatability than Argos for all parameters but length thickness and axial length, and higher repeatability than older instruments based on uh, partial coherence interferometry. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Giacomo. Those are, uh, those are very impressive data. I think the uh, the thing that really jumps out to me is the repeatability for the corneal measurements uh, because as we, you know, kind of think about what, what are the sources of our error in our IOL calculations, it's, it's, it's cornea and it's uh, the prediction of the effective lens position. And if you can have excellent repeatability at, at that level, that may be a really huge step forward in, in helping our patients. Yeah, I think that cornea power is no more a problem uh, uh, in the vast majority of patients when we have devices like this uh, that are so fast because being fast uh, is important, they, especially with older patients that maybe uh, are not able to maintain the fixation for a long time and having a very fast device is important and I think it's part of the success of uh, uh, high repeatability. Yeah, very interesting. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Thanks Giacomo, great paper. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at a very interesting case. Uh, David's going to share with us uh, a fascinating case that uses a lot of the unique features of the ISTAR in patient uh, determining the patient's optimal treatment. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for introducing me and being here this morning. I want to share with you an interesting case here. And the, the reason why I proposed and actually Hawkstrait allowed me to present this case is that you can actually see the device performance on, on the extreme of, of cases. We all treat patients and having a, a patient making him, him or her happy is, is what, what we are working for and what we have studied for. And, and these extreme cases, these are the, the patients we, we care for most and are our most difficult ones sometimes. So I have... Uh, Quite, quite some aniridia patients, and this is a woman, 41 years young. She, she was born with bilateral congenital aniridia, and as you all know, that is a complex eye disease. She was referred to me because of um, decreasing visual acuity due to her cataracts, but she had other diseases. I, I treated her mother already with, a, with an osteodontokeratoprosthesis, and, and, and hence she, she was referred to me. She, she came to me actually on, on her request as well um, with the question how she could improve her vision, which has deteriorated from 0 0.3 to 0 0.1 in both eyes. That's, that's the images of, of her. She agreed to have the uh, images presented, obviously. And, and you can see actually that she, she suffers from mitosis. She has a complete 
and Iridia, um, as well as, as amblyopia with nystagmus. She, she has an ocular hypertension, hyper, um, hyperopia, and, and forward hypoplasia. So, so the whole complex of congenital aniridia. Obviously, since I treat the whole family, we have determined the genetic um, frame shift deletion. And you might remember this is a PAX6 gene frame shift deletion. We exactly know where in this family is this gene um, deletion. And here we come to the device. That's the, the initial and first measurement. The measurements were not as easy as, as we can have seen, but it was absolutely feasible. Um, and you see right side, very flat cornea. Actually, what you can see is that it's a hyperopic guide, 22.11 millimeters. Um, anterior chamber, note that the ACD um, is, is, is measured as 2.24 millimeters with a 600 micrometers cornea, which leaves you with about 1.6 millimeters of anterior chamber space to do your cataract surgery in the end. So all this with, with one view, we know this is gonna be a complicated eye um, with, with already some, some filaments on the cornea, so ocular hypertension, um, and, and that's, that's what you measure with such a device. Oops, down black here as well. So if we go into the, uh, out of the cataract suite and, and into the, the AC, the extended suite, we can image the whole cornea and the whole anterior segment. And the beauty of this patient was that with, with almost complete aniridia, you could actually see the whole lens um, in, in this patient. And I'm telling you later just why this is interesting and important. Um, but first, I want to go to the results. These are the biometric results. We've seen with Adi already that he's doing the same thing. We have five different formulas for the same Vivinex IOL. That's our standard um, aspheric IOL, which we implant. And, and in, this, in this patient, we have the option from 29, millime, uh, 29 diopters up to 30.5 um, diopters to reach emetropia. Um, with the RBF method, actually, you see that there's all the, the exclamation marks um, telling us that this is a measurement which is out of bound, which we, we know already since this is a special case. So, how would you proceed? How did I proceed? Obviously, ptosis repair is, is something which is going to be done after we, we put the speculum inside, so this is not an option. PKP keratoposthesis is not yet necessary in, in her, fortunately, and we are left with three possibilities. There's no right or wrong in, in this patient, I think. I, I actually went and did a FICO IOL and artificial iris in, in the capsule back. Um, since in, in these patients, you, you know, glaucoma, ocular hypertension is, is a risk factor and endothelial decompensation as well in a shallow anterior chamber to do cataract surgery and everything, putting in, in the sulcus where you have anatomical ab aberrations, um, uh, an implant, I just, didn't feel it was right. Um, I, I usually put it in the back. Um, in these patients, otherwise, if you have an uh, aniridia with, with a traumatic aniridia, it's, I, I prefer putting them in, into the sulcus. And actually, um, on, on the professional use brochure of the Human Optics Custom Flex, it says if you want to put it into the capsule back, um, the, the natural lens has typically an approximate diameter of 10 millimeters, but in in, in special cases, um, you should estimate based on the size of the evacuated capsular back once a capsular tension ring has been placed, uh, especially in smaller eyes, which 20, 22 millimeters I consider is a smaller eye. So how do you actually um, estimate the, the, the capsular back once you have emptied it um, intraoperatively? So I went into the literature. Um, there is a device which, which is not available yet, they, they just published it, which you can actually put in, it's a, it's a silicon ring with, with a ruler on it, and you actually can measure intraoperatively how many millimeters it stucks out, and it, it doesn't hurt, uh, it doesn't damage the, the capsular back. Um, it's not available, so that's just for, for curiosity I, I found this, but otherwise you just have to measure somehow and estimate somehow the, the capsule back. I, I went into literature again and, and wanted to see how, how often there's complications with, with 
um, artificial iris is put into the sulcus, and, and the burden they claim in the literature is between 14 and 25 percent, especially with coronal decompensation and glaucoma. So that's the reason I, I didn't want to put it in, into the sulcus. Um, there's one paper out, they report on 19 eyes, where, where they put the artificial iris in the back, and as you can see, there were out of 19 eyes, two any iridia eyes, and out of these 19 eyes, 14 had complications with, with vaulting, oversizing the, the artificial iris, and the two aniridia cases were among these four um, oversized patients. So that's the reason why I just wanted to know exactly or as accurately as possible the capsular back diameter. Went back to, to Hagstreit, and they were very, very, really, really helpful. I said, listen, I have a, a patient, she has got a complete aniridia. Um, we have radial scans, a lot of, of radial scans with, with the, the eye star. Um, actually, I'm, I'm outlining, if I could see the screen, sorry. I'm, I'm manually outlining you what, what is for me the, the capsule back, and if you could actually measure the, the diameter via horizontal line, um, that, that would be very helpful, and I would be very grateful in the patient as well. Um, Swiss Precision, they didn't leave it with that. I, I just took a few couple of radial scans. They, they, they went into all the radial scans um, with, with two members of their staff. They, they exactly measured um, the lens in all radial scans twice in, in each, from, from each employee. They, they plotted this and fitted this in all three dimensions and actually came up with, with the result that the right lens has a diameter of 9.84 millimeters mm -hmm. and the left lens has a diameter of 9.64 millimeters. So I think uh, I never had any more accurate result than, than this. And, and hence, I don't want to oversize the, the implant. I had refined the, the, the artificial iris to 9.5 millimeters then. That's the video, and I think we have enough time. Um, it's, it's sped up eight, eight times. Um, shallow anterior chamber, it's actually my, my colleague, Tama Tandogan, who's performing the, the cataract surgery. Um, vision blue, you see the polar cataract here. Um, just speed it up a bit, capsular axis. Regular FACO, uncomplicated FACO, um, implantation of the lens, CTR, which is important. Um, I always put in aniridia cases um, a capsular tension ring. Um, since they are prone for complications and, and inflammation and, and shrinkage and everything, so I would recommend if you ha ever have a congenital aniridia uh, cataract case, put in a capsular tension ring. That's the trephination, 9.5 millimeters of the artificial iris. I was out of focus, sorry. Um, putting the implant in, the shooter. And then actually injecting it into the capsule bag. As you can see, I tilt up the lens a bit to, to the 12 o'clock position, put it in at the six o'clock position directly in the capsular bag, have two instruments, unfold it. Sometimes you need an endocapsular uh, forceps, uh, an endo-ocular forceps to, to pull it down at the 12 o'clock to bring it in completely into the capsular bag and remove the visco elastic and that's it. So here you can see the result. Hyperopic patient plus, almost plus five, diopters hyperopia. Visual acuity with the cataract 0.1. We put in a 30 diopter Vivinex. Um, we we thought we, we go safe. Um, don't want to overdo it. Don't come out myopically. Aimed for we're looking at the Barrett formula. Aimed for emetropia. And and actually what what came out was a slight hyperopic um, result. Um, unsurprisingly, Hoffer Q would have been a little bit better in this hyperopic eye. Um, but we just didn't want to take, take the risk, ending up too much, too, in a too high uh, myopic patient. As you can see, since I put this into the capsule back and you have the sonulus, there's always this, this black remnant of light going through the eye um, since the, the capsule back is not going out to the sulcus. Um, I discussed this with the patient. It's, it's actually not that disturbing for her. 
she knew it, she knew it before, and I didn't again didn't want to take the risk for endothelial decompensation, and didn't want to take the risk for for ocular hypertension or even glaucomatous damages. So that's why we we accepted that known um, default. Actually, my my colleague um, asked me, and I, I I was surprised that I never thought about it myself. Or like, uh, it's a good question. Um, putting in an IOL, putting in a capsular tension ring, putting in an artificial iris, how much weight do we put in, in this, into this bag and how, how heavy does it become? Is, is this a similar problem for a 41-year-old patient and do we get a, a subluxation or luxation of the whole bag in the future? So went back to the manufacturers, uh, looked into literature. Actually, uh, a, a cataract lens is about 220 milligrams of weight um, with, with the capsular bag. I guess the capsular bag is quite light. And, and the IOL in, in, that, in that power, the, the capsular tension ring, and the artificial iris in that size of 9.5 millimeters ends up to 51 milligrams. So we're well below the, the weight of the natural lens of 220 milligrams. So I, th I think we're, we're safe putting all these three devices um, in or into the, the capsular bag. Well, the future will show me what this will actually bring. And she, she opted for, for green irises. In this patient, I did later on a bilateral ptosis repair, and she ended up with her normal amblyopic vision and was very happy with the result. And to conclude, I, I really have to say that this, this device we've heard of is, is actually very well performing, and in comparison with all the other devices, it's equal. But what, what is about great is, is actually that the, the imaging device, which, which helps you very much, and, and the staff, the support from, from Hagstreit is, is very fast and very quick. If you have special cases, special needs, they will always reply um, very quickly and help you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, David. I think the other point to make, of course, is if you were to put a lens in the sulcus of an aniridia patient, you're at risk for the, stimulating the inflammation that could lead to the aniridia fibrosis syndrome, so which is the last thing you want. We found that you have to increase the power of the IOL when you use uh, the human optics device by about half or three quarters of a diopter because it pushes the IOL a little posteriorly, so fantastic result. Yeah, and we agree, you know, you've got this little rim around the edge that, I mean, what are you going to do? That's that's that's, that's yep. hundred you know, ninety nine percent better. <laughs> I think we can uh, close the session. Thanks very much for everyone for attending and for uh, Hogstrife for sponsoring this session for us. Have a great day. Enjoy your meeting, everyone. What this symposium introduced was a next level technology for cataract planning, with very precise keratometry, the measurement of axial length and other things we use in Iowa calculations. And I think it just takes things to the next level. The symposium has shown again that the iStar is an excellent machine, a device which, which is very helpful and very useful in daily practice. The case I presented is a complex and complicated patient. Even in most complicated eye diseases, the iStar performs excellently. Well, I always love to hear uh, Warren Hill talking about high order aberrations. I always learn something new. And also the case by David Goldblum was uh, really amazing. And I learned that I can uh, measure the diameter of the uh, capsule, you know, with the iStar, which was new to me. Uh, when uh, I tried the iStar for, for the first time, I was really impressed by how fast it is. It's probably the fastest machine on the market. At the same time, how easy? Because it, the process is fully automated. So we don't need the expert technicians to do that. It takes a, the, the learning curve is almost nothing. Having something that is at the same time accurate and fast is so important for any practice with cataract preoperative measurements. We're very excited to release the iStar anterior chamber suite. Um, after now, our cataract suite for the iStar um, biometer is nearly complete. The anterior chamber suite really comes with up to 12 millimeter topography, up to 12, 18 millimeters imaging, um, topography as of the anterior and posterior cornea. Well, we're just about to introduce a full extation screening suite, um, including a Berlin ABCD grading. So Hawkstride focusing in his product development really on the needs of 
the user. So we try to consider the surgeon's needs, but also the needs of the technician that often run the devices. And therefore, it's always a combination of ease of use and complexity and completeness of the results. So one of the things I really like about the iStar is that it allows us to use three tools for planning for cataract surgery. The axial curvature map, an aberration profile, and also image simulation. And these three things can be used together to help us plan for which IOLs might be appropriate for an individual patient, and also to allow the patient to see how their vision will be following cataract surgery. These are very powerful tools that can be used together.